traditions and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present, but under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Folklore Podcast. I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and author. The normal guest episode of the Folklore Podcast for this month has been pushed back due to timing issues, and so instead, in this edition, I thought I would offer you something unusual. I am known predominantly as a researcher and non-fiction author, but a while ago I was asked if I would contribute a short fiction story for an anthology of Lovecraft-inspired tales, Secret Invasion, which was sold in aid of the mental health charity Mind. My story was called The Padding Horror, and combined elements of my research into black dog folklore, local folk traditions and history. Today, I invite you to listen to a full rendition of this story, read by Sam Burns, the voice of our introductory music. This is The Padding Horror. The Padding Horror by Mark Norman Read by Sam Burns There were only four people in my life of any importance to me. Just four. Three of them were now gone. Plucked from my life and from existence itself by that infernal animal. Only Cassandra is left. And so, I must do this to save her from the same fate. The universe must take me, so that the creature cannot take her. Only I, alone, can stop them, for I have found their portal, that liminary boundary, the gateway between this universe and theirs, is here, in the bowels of this unassuming cottage hospital, and I believe I can close the gap. What will happen to me, I cannot tell. Truth to tell, it matters not. If it wipes me from existence in this realm, then so be it. It is a small price to pay. If they take me, then she may remain. That is all that matters. Dear, sweet Cassandra may continue to live her blameless life. And the dog can go and hunt for souls in some other corner of the sphere, some other plane of existence, far from me and far from her. But we must begin at the beginning. I have lived all my life in a small cottage on the edge of Chagford Common. It is a remote, wild place at times, and it takes a hardy soul to exist there on the extremes of Dartmoor. But exist there we do, or at least we did. My father was a sheep farmer, keeping stock upon the common. My mother tended the family home, and washed and spun fleece to sell at the local market. And my poor sister Emily, not long out of her schooling, would run errands for us all, while she learned the ways of the world from my parents. My first experience of the dog was on a wild winter's night some three months ago. The wind had a bitter chill. I recall we had retired early, 
for it was not a night to be out. The rain had battered relentlessly on the window panes of the cottage. But being well used to such weather, I had drifted off easily enough into a dreamless sleep. It was just before two in the morning when I was awoken by the strangest, most unearthly sounds from the common in the distance. This I know, for the old grandfather clock in the hall briefly broke off its relentless tick, 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 to chime two knolls of the hour. As the sound of the bell reverberated away to nothing, and the pendulum once again continued counting time ever onwards, the sound from outside came again. It was carried on the strong wind of the storm, but it was howling not like the wind around the chimney coals or eaves created, for I had heard those oft enough through many winters as the moor threw all of its might against the house for nights on end. This howling was not natural. It was animalistic, and yet somehow unlike any animal I had heard before, surrounded as we were by sheep, cattle, and the hardy Dartmoor ponies, I was well versed with their sound both in pleasure or in pain, and this was none of these. It was canine, and yet somehow not. It began to howl as a normal dog, of large size judging by the tone, but it continued, developed into something more, something foreboding, something horrific, something... Infernal. I sat up in bed, quite awake now, listening intently to the noise. It had, I thought, sounded quite distant when it began, but as the sound changed, moulding itself from a dog to something indescribable, it got louder. It was as if it was approaching the cottage, and yet nothing else seemed to stir. I could see the flock in the distance, wind-battered and wet, but grazing as normal. As the volume of the sound increased, it began to appear as if some demon was sent from another world. The atmosphere itself seemed to change. The air felt thicker somehow, as if it were closing in around me. I could feel my heart rate rising as the infernal noise from outside, whining, howling, screaming almost, appeared to get nearer and nearer. At last, just as I thought that my ears could stand to hear it no longer, there came an almighty crash against the old glass panes of the bedroom window, as if the creature itself had flung itself at the casement. I threw my hands over my face instinctively shielding myself from the force of the glass that was inevitably going to be flung into the room. And then, nothing. Silence. Save the still wind blowing, and the tick, tick, tick of the old clock, steadily counting the seconds away. I dropped my hands to my sides and looked up. The window remained shut fast unbroken and firm. No glass, no damage, no creature. I sat in bed for some minutes, contemplating what had just occurred, before I rose and crossed to the window. Looking out of the casement into the darkness, I listened to the wind as it continued to whip around the outside of the cottage, battering the glass with detritus whipped up from the ground. I returned to my mattress and sank back, pulling the thin covers over me. What had I just experienced? It could surely not have been just the storm, just a trick of the mind and some of the ear. I closed my eyes and thought on the event before finally drifting off into a dreamless repose. As I sat at breakfast with my family the following morning, I chose to mention nothing of the previous night. My parents, my father particularly, were simple folk, but did not hold with the traditions and law of the area like so many others. They lived, they worked. Nothing more, nothing less. So instead I sat, shared in the simple repast of the morning, 
and then set out on the day's errands. Being a market day, I had to take the horse and cart across the moor to Tavistock. It was a journey I made every week, shared with my good friend Stevenson, who also bought and sold wares in the town. He was less of closed mind than my family, and I resolved to question him on the subject as we made the drive. Fascinating, Stevenson expounded some two hours later as we sat atop the cart, the old horse clopping its way over the well-worn track toward Tavistock. You know, of course, of the yes hounds. I assured him that I had not, and he proceeded to tell me of the legend of the great black hounds, said to accompany a phantasmal hunting party on wild nights such as we had just experienced. They say, according to Stevenson, that a devil leads the hunt, and that a party of other creatures ride alongside. Stevenson referred to them as lesser demons though the term seemed strange to me, and I did not remember any such thing from the scant Bible classes which I had been forced to attend in my younger days. Stevenson scoffed at the idea. The Bible does not account for all in this world, my friend, he said. There are creatures, places far beyond any that may be found in those pages. The Book of Revelations is probably all that comes close. John, being the author of those words, evidently knew more than most. His words seemed odd to me, and I was about to question him further on them, when he continued. I think there is something in the town that might interest you, he said. We will go there after the market, no more until then. And indeed he spoke no more on the subject. We crossed the moor on an uneventful drive, visited the market, and having undertaken all those jobs we set out to do, found ourselves with a spare couple of hours before we needed to head back. Stevenson took me to the Bedford Hotel, and told me that the function room was currently in use for the display of a travelling exhibition of antiques and oddities that had been collected from around the country. I wondered what the relevance of this was, but explaining that I would find out soon enough, he led me on, and soon, I found myself in a room full of curios. Ignoring all of these, Stevenson led me to a cabinet at the back of the room, which had been turned into a form of makeshift library. It was here that was located the item which he evidently thought important. This is what I wanted you to see, he said, pulling from the cabinet an ancient-looking tome which he laid on the table in front of us. This is called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, he explained. It's a kind of official history of old England. It was written for one of the kings in years past. This is not the original, he continued, but rather one of the copies. Stevenson went on to explain that the original document was sent, about a thousand years past, to monasteries around the country where copies were made. These copies were kept in different towns and the monks continued to update them with such events as they thought important. This one comes from a town called Peterborough, Stevenson told me. I had not heard of it, but he said it was in the north of England somewhere. They say, he continued, that the abbot of this particular monastery was very disreputable. Nobody knows for certain what was going on there, but there were some strange things recorded in this book. Things not of this world, but another. This is the bit I thought would be important. He leafed through the pages, looking for a particular passage to show me. Finally, his hand fell on the paragraph he was looking for. I looked, but there were no words upon the page. At least, nothing that I recognized as words in any case. It's written in the native tongue, he said, but I can read it to you. Now, I will freely admit that Stevenson is a more learned man than I, but I wondered how he was able to read these markings that I did not understand. I asked him, but he quietened me, saying it was not important. He bade me listen, and then read the passage aloud. Many men, he quoted from the page, both saw and heard a great number of huntsmen hunting. The huntsmen wore black, huge and hideous, and rode on black horses, 
on black he-goats, and their hounds were black, big-eyed, and loathsome. He closed the book and returned it to the cabinet. Come on, he said with no more explanation. You have seen what I needed you to see. Let us go back home. Despite my questioning him further on the subject, Stevenson was no more forthcoming with the information as we crossed back from Tavistock, past Princetown, and over two bridges, before arriving back in Chagford. He just told me that I needed to have seen the passage, that it was important, and that he was sure it would hold some meaning for me over the event of the previous night. Eventually I gave up and turned to other subjects before we finally dropped down over the hill into Chagford. It was getting rather late by the time I delivered Stevenson home, and packed away the goods and chattels from the market, and the cottage was hidden in darkness. I could do nothing more that night but retire, still thinking upon the book and the curious words that Stevenson had shown me. My dreams that night were haunted with strange visions that I did not understand, of galloping horses, strange creatures, of hideous demeanour, sat atop black, shaggy-haired animals, and running alongside them, black dogs with large red eyes, strange half-canine, half-human features. Is that the right term? Half-inhuman is more accurate. The night was restless. Not outside the house, for, unlike the previous one, it was calm and still, but rather inside, as my mind wrestled with these images. I recall that I awoke at what must have been two or three, thinking that I had heard again those strange sounds from outside in the fields. The feeling was strong enough that I lit a lantern and, slipping on some boots and a gown, went outside to look. Save the bleating of the sheep in the field, it seemed still and quiet. I rounded the corner of the cottage, towards the area over which my first-floor bedroom looked. The edges of the cottage sink into the earth alongside the clitter of Dartmoor granite. I picked my way along by the light of the lantern, until, drawing level with the kitchen window, over which my bedroom was located, I noticed something strange about the ground. It was an area I had trodden many times, so to me it was obvious when something was not as it usually appeared. I bent down to take a closer look at the ground beneath the window, extending my arm forwards to cast the light of the lantern around me. There in the ground, within the flickering arc of the lantern's light, was a single footprint. Deep, clear, canine. Long claw marks were clearly visible protruding from the impression of large pads sunken into the mud. Large in the way that a shire horse is large when placed next to a Dartmoor pony. I looked around, but there were no others leading up to or away from the cottage. Just this single impression on the ground. It made no sense. The ground was wet from the previous night's storm, so other prints would have been clearly visible. I stared at the ground, unable to fully comprehend what I was seeing. All of a sudden, a loud bleat of a sheep caused me to start and brought me back to reality. I pulled my gown around me. Suddenly cold, despite the relative mild air of the night, and returned to the cottage, not understanding what was happening. At breakfast the following morning, I sat in silence, pondering, thinking on the events of the last twenty-four hours. "'What's up with thee?' demanded my father, demolishing what looked like a side of bacon, jammed between two doorstep wedges of bread. Reticent about telling him what had happened, knowing what his response was likely to be, I shrugged the question off. Don't be daft, he pressed further. Thou's had a girt frown on thy face since thou got back from Tavy. What's the bloody miserable bout? I sighed and relayed the events to him. Emily sat opposite me at the table, listened intently, 
and when I got to the footprint from a few hours past, I thought her jaw was going to actually hit the flagstone to the floor. Father grunted and was about to speak when Emily rushed to the window and looked out. Where? Where is it? I don't see nothing. Emily, go and help Ma with the pots, Father scolded. She protested, of course, but was dispatched to the sink. I crossed to the window and looked out. But indeed, she was right. The earth outside, though still wet, was flat. There was no footprint. I could not have imagined it, nor dreamed it. I went outside. After all, I knew this to be true, as I could clearly see my own boot prints leading up to the window. I stammered my lack of understanding out loud, to nobody in particular, but my father jumped upon it. Enough, he chastised. We don't want to hear no more, aunt, and we certainly don't want to hear no more about old books and the like. You'm daft to think, aunt. Them things is cursed, most like. And keep away from that Stevenson. He's odd, that un. There are some rumours about him round Chagford. I tried to question him on what he meant. What rumours? And what about Stevenson? But he would speak no more, and I trudged out to the field to tend the sheep. That afternoon I accompanied Emily into town, for she had been sent some provisions from the butcher. I wanted to visit dear Cassandra, but knew that I must needs walk Emily back to the cottage after her errand, and so would not have the chance. But fate, it seemed, had another deck to deal that afternoon. We were just leaving the butcher's shop when we bumped into Stevenson in the street. Mr. Stevenson, cried Emily. My brother, he told me about the noises, and last night he went out, and there was a giant footprint in the earth, and now tis gone. She paused for breath at this point, allowing Stevenson to interject with a laugh. Slow down, Miss Emily, he laughed. You'll do yourself an injury. Now, what's all this about? She was about to speak again, but I scolded her, telling her that, though not believing such, I had obviously been mistaken, and that I must have imagined it. Whatever was happening to me, there was no need to involve Emily, young as she was in such things. Stuff and nonsense. There is more to this. You just do not have the knowledge. Come to my house and we will talk further. Bring Emily with you. She will understand. I protested, arguing that Emily was young and impressionable, and trying to make excuses for things that I had said in front of her. But Stevenson would have none of it. It was at that point that I realised, for all our years of companionship, that I had never once been to Stevenson's house. We had met quite frequently, but always on the way to market, or at the inn, but never at his home. I must confess that this fact, and his eagerness, left me more than a little intrigued. And so I relented, and we walked down the road to his cottage, one of a terrace of small miners' cottages. As we walked, I explained to Stevenson about the events of the previous night, of the dream and the footprint. Stevenson remained quiet and attentive until we reached the front door of his house. Its blue paintwork had faded over many years of neglect. He turned the old, round wooden handle, and with a glance over his shoulder, I noticed, ushered us inside. The interior of the cottage took me aback for it was not what I expected to see. I cannot say for certain what it was I did expect, but it was not that. One wall had been covered with makeshift shelves, on which stood rows of dusty old books, sheaves of paper, and a strange variety of stuffed animals. I saw a crow, two weasels, and a rabbit, and most strange of all, on the top shelf was the skull of an animal I could not identify. It was of similar size to a sheep, but most definitely was not, for I had seen plenty of those in my time. I had started to scan the books on the shelves, and the mix was eclectic, to say the least. But before I could look too deeply, Stevenson pulled down an old, leather-bound book with a brown cover, and had started flicking through the pages, looking for something in particular. 
He found the page that he required and turned the book to face me. Was this roughly what you saw? he asked me. On the page was a pencil drawing of a footprint of remarkably similar size and shape to the one that I had found the previous night. I agreed that it was, and he looked intrigued. He snapped the book shut before I had time to study anything more of the handwritten notes which surrounded the image, save noticing that the top of the page had been labelled Yes to scale. I asked Stevenson what the book was, but he was not forthcoming with any information on its contents. But he did continue to inform me that it was part of a collection of items which he had acquired which originally came from a house called Brook, which stood on the outskirts of Buckfast Lee, to the south of the county. The owner was a squire by the name of Richard Cabell, Stevenson told me. He was something of a notorious character, and, like me, he collected bizarre objects. A number of things you see around you come from there. I came by them as a job lot, and they are most interesting. A number of these books are most unusual, and some have taken some work to decipher. I should not discuss their contents with you now, for I believe there are things therein which are perhaps not suitable for Emily to understand just now. Emily looked down heartened, as she had been listening with avid interest, her child's mind, no doubt, racing with possibilities. Ah, but Emily wants to know more. I started to protest, but he stopped me in my tracks. Don't worry yourself, I shall say no more, he continued. Emily, I shall show you and your brother something else instead, something even more interesting and even more mysterious. These last words he delivered to Emily in mock horror, and her eyes widened. He led us out through the parlour into his small garden and down the path to a stone-built outhouse at the far end. Pushing open the door, he drew us inside. Inside was a large piece of machinery, the likes of which I had never seen before, with some kind of thick glass window, oval in shape, in its centre. Thick rivets held the glass in place, and behind it heavy steam or vapour seemed to circulate, although no heat radiated from the device. Metal pipes snaked from this chamber to smaller receptacles on its sides, and from the top a large funnel disappeared through the roof of the outhouse. Emily stared, as did I, at the machinery. It resembled nothing I had seen in any farm or in any factory. What is it? she asked Stevenson. Ah, now that is a good question, he replied. What is it indeed? I'll tell you what it is, young Emily. It is a mystery. That's what it is. I have spent years trying to figure it out. Stevenson explained to us that the machinery had also come from Brook with the other ephemera. But its purpose continues to be a mystery. He had assembled it with the aid of diagrams which he had found in one of the books. But as to its purpose, he could not tell us, or would not tell us, for I got the feeling that Although he professed no knowledge, he was concealing something. Why would he have brought us here otherwise, if not to show me the drawing of the footprint in the book? I started to feel somewhat uncomfortable, and decided that I should make my excuses for us to leave. I told him that I wanted to pay a visit to my beloved Cassandra, but that it was late and Emily needed to be taken back to the cottage for the evening duties. And so it was that we left Stevenson and his books, and his strange outhouse, and walked up through the old town to our home. I delivered Emily back to the house and decided that I needed time to think. Telling her to go and do her chores and speak nothing of our afternoon to our parents, a request which I knew would be carried out, for she was a good girl and would cause no trouble, I decided to take an evening constitutional. My second experience of the dog was that evening, during my walk. I had taken a circular route around the town, which was quiet and peaceful in the dim sea light of dusk time. I had probably strolled for three quarters of an hour or so, and was making my way back to the cottage along the back road, which was lined with trees and lit by the occasional gaslight, which the lamplighter had fueled 
probably half an hour previous. The air and countryside seemed strangely still. It struck me as odd, as the night birds preparing to nest down for the evening were usually fluttering and twittering at this time. I thought on it as I walked, and, inclining my head, listened more intently to the sounds of the countryside, or rather, the quiet of the night, for I could hear nothing. After a minute or two, having slowed my pace somewhat to concentrate, I became aware of muffled footsteps in time with my own. I stopped, and immediately they ceased. I listened hard, but there was nothing, and so I took a few tentative steps forwards. There they were again, matching my pace, but keeping the same quiet volume which suggested to me that they were never gaining nor losing distance. I stopped again and slowly turned, and there it was, standing on the edge of the pool of flickering light being cast downward by the gas lamp. I could make out an indistinct black mass. It seemed shapeless, but gradually I became aware of the two red marks cutting through the gloom. Pinpricks at first, but the more I looked, the larger they became until they resembled two glowing coals hovering in the darkness. I stared at them, transfixed. I wanted to turn away, but I could not. Those glowing red orbs seemed to draw me in, to reach out and grab me by my very soul and pull me toward them. Though physically my feet stayed planted to the spot, and I did not move. As I looked, the black cloud seemed to draw itself together into a form, melding out of the chaos to become more real, more solid, more animalistic. It drew forward slightly into the edge of the gaslight glow, and I could make out the contours of its face in the shadows. Surrounding those two horrible eyes, as I now saw them to be, cheek and jowl materialized, and an awful canine demeanor. As if solidified in my gaze, I made out the body of a great dog, as it sat, stock still, on the edge of the light. As I watched, it stared back. It did not move. It did not make a sound. It just stared. I wanted to turn away, to run in the other direction, but I could not. Those two great eyes seemed to hold me in place, and then, as quickly as the apparition had formed, it rose, backed away from me, out of the light, and was gone. It took me probably fifteen or twenty seconds to gather my composure, although those seconds felt like minutes in their passing. When I could finally move, I turned tail and ran up the road as fast as I was physically able back to the cottage. Bursting through the front door, I took the stairs two at a time to the top landing, into my room, shut the door, and bolted the door fast. Despite the protestations of my family that I had not taken dinner, I refused to emerge for the rest of the night, giving no reason, until finally they gave up and left me in there. It was the last I would ever hear of one of them. I was woken from a deep yet troubled sleep in the early light of dawn by a shrill scream of my mother from down below. I sat, bolt upright, for there was sheer terror in the sound that emanated from beneath me. Throwing on my gown, I dashed from the room, and was immediately confronted by the vision of a crumpled heap on the foot of the stairs. It was my father, who it seemed had tripped on a ruck in the rug on the landing, and, losing his balance, had fallen to the floor below. Emily ran down from her room to see what the commotion was, but before she could get there I scooped her up and turned her away, for I could not let her see our father lying dead before us, with his neck snapped backwards at a sickening angle. I returned her to her room, and held her tight, sobbing with her as the screaming continued from the hall. He was buried three days later at the church of St. Michael in a simple ceremony, and in a simple grave. 
Of the intervening period I cannot speak, for it is too full of heartache and grieving for me. The church was full of local farmers and tradespeople, with which our family have always had a good relationship, and we sat at the front in sombre silence, clad in traditional black, before following the coffin to the bleak graveyard outside, dampened by the common drizzle of the moor. As we left the churchyard, Stevenson took me to one side, extending his sympathies for our loss. Emily stopped with me. But our mother pulled her on, and bade her return home. I left them to walk their slow walk, and followed Stevenson, who requested that I walk down to his home for some refreshment, and some time to talk. Feeling the need for a change of scenery, I accepted his offer, and walked the short distance to his door in silence. Once inside his strange cottage, he offered to brew us some tea, but upon my request for something stronger, under the circumstances, fetched two glasses of brandy from an archaic sideboard, buried underneath piles of paper. We sat in two moss-eaten old armchairs for a couple of minutes, sipping the warming liquid, before Stevenson broke the silence. You've seen it again, haven't you? he inquired. I stared at him, saying nothing. But my face must have told the complete story where my words did not. Yes, you have, he said. I knew it, and that is the cause. That is the fiend that is fairly responsible for the death of your father. I looked at him aghast, protesting that he had tripped and fallen down the stairs, but Stevenson would have none of it. It is a yeth hound, he explained. It is a portent, and you have looked into its eyes. I said nothing. Look, he continued, you recall my telling you that Richard Cavill owned much of these things. He gestured around the room to the books and papers that lay strewn around the room. He knew of it, and studied it. Of that I am certain. The legend is well known, but I believe now that it is more than a legend. There are references, paragraphs among these papers that refer to the animal in detail. I showed you the drawing of its footprint, the one that matched the one you saw outside your window. There is more. It tells how anyone looking into the face of the beast is sure to suffer some death or disaster soon afterwards. I looked aghast and told him he was being ridiculous, that he should have more care and consideration for what I had just been through. Draining my glass, I rose to leave, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me back down into my chair. Calm yourself, my friend, he said gently. It is not ridiculous. It is all recorded here in these pages. He waved his arm around the room in a wide sweep. Do you know how he died? He was, it is said, and I have no reason to doubt it under the circumstances, chased across the moor by a pack of demonic hounds, run down by them, hunted, if you will, Traditions say that he was an evil man, and that I believe he found some link, some bridge between here and somewhere else. I could not quite comprehend what he was telling me. Was he saying that the hounds had been summoned in some way? It was not possible. I thought him mad to consider it, but then I thought on what I had already seen and experienced and wondered if maybe I was the one who was deranged. What had I seen those three days previous? Was it a trick of the light, or something more? I came back to the present as Stevenson beckoned me up, out of the chair, to accompany him to the garden. You look like you could do with some fresh air, he said. He recharged my glass, and I followed him out into the small lawned area at the rear of the property. A small plume of black smoke rose from a makeshift chimney atop his old outhouse at the bottom of the garden. I remembered my previous visit, and that strange contraption contained therein. Walking down the path, I approached the grimy window of the outhouse and peered through the glass. There inside was the same large copper cylinder with its array of pipework. I gazed in at the oval viewing panel in the centre of it, wondering just what it was that was assembled in there. The same wispy clouds of vapour 
rolled and circulated around the inside of the cylinder, but somehow they seemed darker than before. I watched them transfixed for a couple of minutes as they performed their strange, hypnotic dance before Stevenson called me back. Come on, he beckoned. You really should get back to your mother and sister. I have kept you here long enough. I'll walk up the road with you. You could do with the company, I'm sure. I turned away from the window to join him at the top of the garden, and as I did so, I could swear that I could see two small glimmers of red among the swirling clouds. My third experience with the dog was but two weeks later, and its tragedy was sadly no less than previous. I was returning from a long day in the fields, where I had been tending to the flocks in readiness for the forthcoming sails. It was late at night by the time I had finished, and I came down across the fields as the mist was beginning to descend. The route was familiar to me, but it was easy to become lost in these wild landscapes when the fogs descended, and so I lit a storm lantern to keep my way true until I reached the edge of the town. And here it was that I saw the infernal creature again. It had rounded the corner into the lane which wound towards our cottage, when a bulk seemed to arise from nowhere out of the gloom ahead. The night was brisk, but not cold, and yet I shuddered even as I saw the shape begin to form. This was not the shivering of inclemency, but rather that cold from within, as if the very blood in my veins was changing to ice water. I knew at once what I was seeing and the voice of Stevenson echoed in my head from our earlier talk. The Yeth Hound. Could it possibly be so? Was Stevenson right? Did the creatures truly exist? I wondered if there was indeed some connection to the old tome which we had examined in Tavistock, to the ephemera of Squire Cabell, which Stevenson told me of in his cottage. And what of the strange device in the outhouse? Thinking back, it seems like so many questions and thoughts, but they raced through my mind almost as one before the creature had formed in front of me. It must have been mere seconds, or maybe it was longer. My recollection of events seems somehow hazy and distant now. I try to remember the details, but I cannot. I know that I felt a sense of intense urgency, that I had to get past, to get home to the cottage. I sensed an impending doom, danger even, but I know now exactly what it was. Once again, I could not move. I was transfixed, wanting to flee but being unable. But then I remember. What? It seems too odd, too curious to be right. I am sure that I remember the dog shape began to somehow transform as it solidified. But how? It does not seem possible, though I am convinced that somehow the head began to morph, to elongate and compress. Try as I might, I cannot bring the full detail of this horror to the forefront of my consciousness. Maybe the mental block is my own. Maybe somehow it is from elsewhere. I would swear upon a dozen Bibles that the features, the very visage of the creature, became more... human? And within that strange human-canine hybrid, if that recollection is even correct, I am sure there was some form of familiarity. I remember no more. Not until I became aware that I was running up to the cottage door. I burst through, not having looked behind me. The cottage was lit, which was as well, as I no longer had the storm lantern. I know not where it went. I ran straight into the arms of Emily, who was sobbing. Mother! she cried. Mother! she said nothing else. She could not. She just kept repeating the word over and over. I held her, trying to calm the hysteria, and asked her where. She gestured to the garden, but could say nothing more. I passed through the kitchen and out of the back door. There, in the gloom of the night... I could see the crumpled body of our mother lying alongside a pile of shattered glass. I looked for the source of the mess, finding eventually 
that it had come out of an upstairs window. She had obviously fallen through somehow, hitting the ground with a terrific shock that looked to have shattered her skull. I turned away. There was nothing that could be done for her, and my only thought now was for Emily. I went back to the kitchen and grabbed a bottle of brandy, the lone bottle that was kept for visitors or special occasions, and poured two large helpings of the brown liquid into a couple of table glasses. I drank one draught, and the other I took to Emily. Forcing her into a chair, I made her drink it, trying anything in an effort to calm her. She coughed and spluttered as the liquid went down her throat, her young palate being unfamiliar with hard liquor. But in a minute or two the alcohol had the desired effect, and she began to calm slightly. I shook her, bringing her round, and asked her what happened. She heard some it. Emily spluttered between gasps from both the effect of the brandy and the shortness of breath from crying. Something hideous. It was like a terrible howling from the fields. She thought someone was out there. After the sheep, perhaps. She ran upstairs. I think she wanted to get a better look from the upstairs window. She paused for breath, after having found enough voice to rattle out these happenings, before continuing. I heard a terrible scream. She was shouting at something out the window, telling it to go away, and then t'was a crash, and then silence. I stared at her. I could not comprehend what was happening. This must have happened at the exact same time I had whatever experience it was that I had undergone in the town. Was it truly the case that some creature, or was it now creatures, from the darkness, were seeking me out somehow. At that moment I became convinced that everyone was in danger. No, not everyone. Everyone I knew. Everyone who was close to me. Father, dead. Mother, dead. I yelled at Emily that we had to leave, immediately. I knew not where, nor why, but we had to go. I dragged her from the chair threw a coat around her, and pulled her from the cottage, urging her to the paddock at the side where we kept our horse tethered. We were both expert riders. Everyone who worked the land was, and had no need of saddle or tackle to ride safely. Besides, there was no time for such things. I remained convinced that we had to leave. I shouted at Emily to get on the horse, and I clambered up behind her. Grasping around her waist, I drove a boot heel into the poor animal's flank, and struck out for the moor, the horse being forced to vault the low stone wall before it knew what was happening. We galloped at full speed across the fields and towards the open moorland, the dark crags of distant tors lit by the full moon, now high in the sky above us. I had no idea where I was heading, nor did I care. I just knew that I had to get Emily away from there. It was then that it hit me. What of Cassandra? She was the only other person dear to me. Was I fleeing with one to leave another behind? Before I knew what I was doing, I was turning the horse to ride back the other way. I had no plan in mind. I was working on instinct. But I knew that something was coming and that I alone could provide salvation for those around me. And then it happened. We galloped headlong for a small copse, and as we did, so a huge black mass rose up from the trees in front of us, and a terrific howl, as if the sky had opened, and all of the demons of I know not where were shrieking from the lost realm. The horse started, turned and reared, Emily and I were thrown like two helpless rag dolls into the air. I hit the ground with a resounding crack. Blackness. Silence. I suddenly became aware of a sound, as of steam escaping under pressure from a cracked pipe. A hissing, interspersed with some other strange noises, started to play on the fringes of my hearing. Water? Or some other liquid moving? I could not see anything, but the sounds began to resolve, metal on metal, some form of grinding or clanking noise, 
A light mist started to form on the edges of the blackness. I was sure my eyes were closed still, and yet I could see swirling patterns emerging from the dark. The noises grew louder in my ears, and I started to become aware of shapes. Long, thin, tube-like structures played across my vision. Red flashes and turning circles. Everything was indistinct. But the noise grew even louder. Hissing, rushing, snarling, howling. My eyes flickered open. The light was blinding, so I snapped them closed again and opened them more slowly. The surroundings were unfamiliar. Brick walls, whitewash, floor tiles. As I came to my senses, I realized that there were beds and people. You're awake, I heard a voice. Everything hurt, but I slowly turned my head to the side to see the face of Stevenson looking back at me. I looked confused and opened my mouth to ask a hundred questions. Not now, he said. There can be time for questions, but this is not it. I know you will have one in particular, and I'm sorry to say that the answer to that one is no. He had, naturally, predicted I would ask about poor Emily. You must rest, he said. Drink this. He offered me a glass, and I took a small sip. More, he insisted. You need more. I struggled, but swallowed more of the clear liquid. He told me to close my eyes, but even as he said it I could feel my lids starting to droop once again. I will return, he said in a low voice, later. In the meantime, do not worry about anything, or any one. I heard him walk away as I lay there. I felt weak and tired, but somehow something was telling me that I could not rest. As I lay in the dark, my mind returned to those images and sounds which I had heard before I had awoken. I struggled to bring them back to my memory. They reminded me of something familiar. What was it? The steam and noise were certainly not unknown. And then it hit me. Stevenson's outhouse. The machinery. The sounds and images faded and were replaced with one. Bright and clear as day. Cassandra. It was at this moment that I realized I must be in mortal peril. Everyone else close to me had gone. I had to save her. But how? And with that, I fell into a deep sleep again. I experienced the strangest dream. At least I believe it was a dream. Or could it have been a vision? A state of some unconscious wakefulness. I became aware of the room around me, and in the corner of the room, sat a large, black hound, staring at me with its deep red eyes. It cocked its head, but somehow, now I was not afraid. I rose from my bed and approached it, and as I did so, it turned its back and walked from the room. I followed it as it led me down corridors and stairs. We headed down to the lower level of the hospital, and the dog, never looking back, was keeping a constant distance in front of me but I was compelled to follow. Eventually, we reached what was obviously the cellar of the building. A large wooden door stood between us and the room beyond. Suddenly, the dog began to dissipate in front of me. It became a black mist of vapour, which seeped between the slats of the door, around the frame and underneath into the room beyond. I approached the door, holding out a hand to push it open. Suddenly, from within, I heard a voice call my name, loudly and urgently. Cassandra. I awoke. I was lying in the bed as before, but somehow everything had suddenly become clear. Cassandra was in danger. She was the last person who was close to me, closer, arguably, than my family had been, and the dog would take her as well, unless, unless it took me first. I knew what I had to do. The only way to stop the dog from taking Cassandra was to allow it to take me. I would have to kill myself, that she may live. This was the meaning of the dream. I needed to go to the cellar. The answer, and the means of inevitable destruction, lay that way. <laughs>
It was late, I calculated, and the building seemed to be sleeping. Many of the beds were empty, and those that were not had curtains drawn around them. Being night, there were few staff around, and they would be busy with their duties, likely to come only if summoned by the ringing of a patient's bell. I rose painfully, but with determination, and headed from the dormitory room. There was no reason to pause, nothing to turn for. The corridors were exactly as they had appeared in my dream. I saw the turn of the corner and the stairs beyond, which I descended with purpose. Suddenly, in front of me, was the wooden door. It seemed warmer down here, hot almost. I pushed the door open and entered the cellar. The room was darker than the corridors down which I had headed, but lit with some form of strange orange glow. The imagery of my previous visions came flooding back to my senses. I heard hissing, liquid, steam. In front of me stood a large metal structure, a machine, with pipework, levers and handles. A large metal cylinder stood at the heart with an oval glass panel riveted to the front like a viewing window. I was transported back to Stevenson's outhouse. This seemed reminiscent almost identical, in fact, though on a much larger scale. So the hospital was some form of portal or boundary. I approached the machinery and looked into the glass. The same swirling mist that I had seen at Stevenson's tumbled and fell within this device. Every so often, as it passed the glass, it seemed to form itself into recognizable shapes. An ear, a tail, a great paw. Without warning, a great light erupted from the centre of the mist, and a piercing red eye seemed to stare at me from within the bowels of the cylinder. I knew what I had to do. In order to save Cassandra, I would need to give myself to the dog, cross the liminal perimeter into the other dimension, so that she may live on. I looked to the pipes on the side of the machine, and the large metal valves and handles. Reaching out, I wrapped my fingers around two large levers on the edge of the cylinder. The whole contraption seemed to vibrate and shudder, the steam hissing and whooshing past my head. The mist behind the glass seemed to become thicker and darker. Great jaws appeared out of it, gnashing and snarling. My grip tightened, and I closed my eyes as, slowly, my hands seemed to fuse themselves into the metal, and I started to become part of the infernal device. If you would like to read more stories from this anthology, visit our website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com, where you will find a link to the Just Giving page. You can buy a copy of the ebook for any donation to the charity. This story is available in our episode supplement this month, which is free to our Patreon supporters. Our normal podcast schedule returns on July the 1st. Thanks for listening. See you next time. The Folklore Podcast is created and hosted by me, Mark Norman. Find out more about my writing and research at www.facebook.com slash marknormanfolklore. The Folklore Podcast Art Director is Melissa Martell. Find her work at www.mdmcreate.com The Folklore Podcast will always be free to listen to, but it is an enormous amount of work to research, create, record and write two of these episodes every month. And so, we have created a simple way in which you can help to support the ongoing life of the Folklore Podcast please visit our website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com and click on support. There are various ways that you can help, and they don't all involve giving us money. Even just leaving a simple review on iTunes or other podcast apps helps to grow our audience. So please do visit and take a moment to help us to keep going. Thank you for listening. The Folklore Podcast theme music is written and performed by Gurdy Bird.